Hi everyone. Welcome to this uh, stream. It's uh, 3 p.m. and wh what I'm going to do is uh, discuss um, a project about, uh, about a function I would like to develop Let me show you the context So I'm a, a professor and an academic, and what I try to do for the last two years is I'm, I try to uh, develop my outreach to uh, you know outside academia. And wh one way to do that is to translate uh, what I do as a, a, as an author of academic papers. I try to translate that into click and point functions that anyone can use without any specific uh, coding skill. So the website is called nocodefunctions.com and it has so far eight functions. So the website is available is one in 107 languages. Uh, let me show you that it's completely, oops, it's completely uh, free and open source with a license that allows anyone to, uh, to reuse it. Uh, and these functions are, at the moment, they are uh, related to what I do. Uh, I like to develop new ways to uh, perform textual analysis and, uh, and visualize networks uh, as a way to explore data sets. Um, so that's how it is now. Uh, and for the last few months, I have I have uh, started these Twitch sessions where uh, once per week for an hour, I, uh, uh, I kind of develop a side project um, live on, on this stream. So I code live uh, uh, and, uh, and hopefully this will become uh, another blue button on this, uh, on this website. And also, hopefully, it's not just a side project. Uh, I'm going to be able to turn it into an academic publication as well, something that uh, yeah, would, uh, would be identified as, a, as an academic contribution. Uh, so as I told you, I started uh, doing these Twitch sessions uh, lay, uh, last October. And my first project consisted in developing a plugin for Giphy. Giphy is this uh, free and open source software to visualize networks. And for many weeks, actually 15 weeks, an hour per week, I've developed a, a plugin for it. And I've just finished that uh, in, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the plugin is released, uh, published, anyone can use it. So now I'm looking at my next project. My next project is uh, actually the, a revival of something that exists for a long time, which are maps of science. Um, I don't have a full uh, history for it, but basically, uh, to summarize, uh, well, let's use this picture, right? So this picture is from uh, uh, a paper by uh, Ismail Raffles and Lut Leidersdorf and Alan Porter as well. And it is quite old now, I would say. It's from the 
is from 15 years ago, more or less. So what do they do? They create a map of science. And how do they do that? Uh, so follow with me on the, uh, on the map. Each dot, each colored dot, is a, a bundle of academic journals. So let's uh, take this one here. You see my, the mouse pointer here? This single dot is actually representing maybe a hundred or a couple of hundreds of journals that are on the same topic. Uh, maybe that's going to be um, many, many journals in, um, in econometrics or a subfield, a subfield of economics. And as you see, you have many dots. So in total, I don't have the exact count, it should be in the paper somewhere, but in total I think that all these dots together represent about 11,000 academic journals. Okay, so as you see these dots are not spread uh, randomly, uh, they seem to be like, some are close from each other, and there is a, actually a link, a connection, and some are, uh, you know, further apart. So why? Two journals, uh, sorry, not journals, two dots that contain journals, or oh, I have a running nose, which is not great <laughs> when you stream. Uh, maybe you're gonna have to pause, never mind. Uh, two dots, so the journals within these dots, two dots are close to each other, they have a strong connection. If, and please follow me, if the journals within them, within the dots, and if the articles that are published by these journals tend to cite the same papers or the same journals, the same things. So these two dots, maybe it's econometrics and this one is behavioral economics, they are close to each other because even if they are different journals, the papers, you know, the articles within them tend to cite the same sources. So if you have this data, if you, if you know the list of 11,000 journals and you have the data about which article within these journals cite which other articles, so if you have this data, and then if you have enough computer power that you can compute, you know, the measure, the similarities, in citation behavior, then you can end up with such a map where uh, you have reduced the complexity of millions of articles from thousands of journals into a single map where, uh, where you kind of reconstruct a geography of science with, uh, I suppose these are the hum humanities actually here, the humanities, and then the social sciences and psychology and uh, biomedical sciences up to uh, uh, the other uh, extremity of, uh, of the shape of the bin where you have engineering and computer science and physics. So why is it a topic? Why it has been done? And why, why do I care and why am I passionate about it today? Several reasons. The first reason I think that we should discuss is why do we care? You know, why, uh, why is it going to be useful to anyone in any capacity? And it's a super cliffhanger. I'm going to just uh, blow my nose and come back uh, so, and I give you the, the answer to this question.
Yes, Veronica, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't switch on my mic again. Thanks a lot, Veronica. Uh, so, my bad. I was just saying, and you saw me gesticulating, pointing to these maps. I was just saying that, why are maps of science useful? I was saying that they are useful because you can overlay information on them. And that's what you see here. You see an overlay of the publications, you know, the, the, the articles published by the researchers at the University of Amsterdam. And how is the overlay working? You just draw bigger the nodes corresponding to the journals where the researchers of Amsterdam have published. So you see these very small nodes there. It means that uh, professors from the University of Amsterdam don't publish often there, but they often publish in these fields and in this big purple field as well. And then you can contrast this map with the one of two other universities, Georgia Tech there and the London School of Economics there. And it allows you to see the distinctive uh, patterns that, that uh, differentiate one organization uh, compared to, to another. So the, these maps have been historically used uh, by uh, uh, research policy makers who are interested in a macro view of science, like at the level of universities or the output of a country or, you know, a macro level like that. So you had that. I don't have follow, I have not followed the, the field uh, very closely since, but in my perception, these maps of sciences were, you know, they have been created 10 years ago and they were quite uh, wonderful, but then the moment has the moment has passed, and and you don't have any publication on them uh, now. Yeah, you do have a lot of scientific maps being produced, and especially with the uh, one of the key software for that is let me write it here. One of the key software for the creation of citation maps is Voz Viewer. But these maps that you create from Voz Viewer, they are, they are not atlases of the entire scientific landscape. They are just maps of a couple of hundred of uh, citations or articles or authors. The maps I'm talking about here, they aggregate the entire output of scientific publications over the globe, right? Okay, so that's for the context. So why would I be interested in reviving this, uh, this topic? The first reason is about the use case. I think that we have not finished exploring the value that these maps could uh, uh, create. I think that it would be super interesting for individual authors or research groups um, uh, or, you know, scientific communities um, to be, you know, to explore the, their output on these maps. Um, so, I, I let me, well, I think I should just mention a use case to be clear. Um, So you have these maps of science. Um, uh, 
Yeah. Um, for example, uh, if you take France, it would be super fun to have this map. So let's take the yeah this map here. That would be interesting to have this map where for any given country, right? I am taking France, but pick the country that you know best. And if you would, so that would be a web application. And with the mouse, you would just point on, on one node and it would give you the list. You could get, download the list of all researchers from this field. That would be that would be funny and interesting. If you would be if you would be interested in you know who are the participants in a given field for a given country or a given university, this map would not just be a static picture. It would be a tool to actually explore uh, a subject. So if you are interested in uh, neuromarketing, so it would highlight the dots where neuromarketing is published. So you would select, so neuromarketing is published in, uh, in different fields, but in cognitive uh, neuroscience for one. And you would click on it and it would retrieve you, for you all the scientists who have published in cognitive neuroscience about neuromarketing for the country that you are interested in. Uh, you could, I would, I would really see that as a tool for exploration of uh, individuals, subjects, organizations, um, and the three combined. I think that would be useful for anyone who would be interested in uh, finding co-authors, looking for a PhD advisor, looking for a specialist on, on a given topic. Uh, I think that would be super, I mean, we would have a kind of exploration tool that would be so much more uh, intuitive and, and powerful than just a search bar where you just type words a bit randomly and, and you can't really, really filter out the results. So that's one reason why I would like to revive these maps is because I think they have not been pushed to their potential in terms of uh, being leveraged to explore scientific, the scientific activity. In uh, you know, in a, especially in a web, interactive web interface. The second reason why this topic can be revived today is that uh, the data sources available to create these maps are much richer today than they were ten years ago. And if we are, and I think we have a bit of time now. What I would like to do is actually start working on that today. At the time, as I told you, what you needed to create these maps were the information about which, which journal cites what in order to make comparisons between journals. If two journals cite the same references, they're going to be close to each other. That supposes that you have access to these information about citations, super private information uh, or available but commercially for a high, high price until recently. But we are super lucky that people at OpenAlex have created a free and, and open data on everything we need. So a catalog of scholarly papers, authors, institutions, and more. 
So thanks to them, if we have this data, it becomes much less daunting to create the maps that I just showed you. Uh, we just have to try. So in the spirit of, uh, you know, not just talking and but actually doing stuff, uh, I would like to start doing it today and in the following weeks uh, with you. Uh, in practice, what do I mean is that I just mean that I'm going to work at adding a blue button there that when you click on it, it opens a, a map of science or uh, a way to explore an atlas of science in the way I just described. So it's a very long project uh, and we start now. So let's switch to my coding environment. And as a, as a way to really get started uh, abruptly, we're going to create this blue button. So the app is free and open source, so you can find the code on, on GitHub. And to create a new button, that's going to take literally uh, two minutes. So let me zoom in. So that's you know the web front, the front end for the app. These files contain Java code for the backend, you know, to have to, to manage uh, user sessions and to launch the, the functions. But the web pages are there. So I've organized them in different uh, folders, but we have a very simple one, which is index. You know, that's the home page. So I click on it. That's the home page. And we have a place where we have buttons. Yeah, that's this. And I sh can simply add a new button by copy pasting the last button and basically uh, giving it a new. OK, I've just pasted the last button. I'm going to give it, so the name is, you know, it's a bit strange because you have all of that. Why is, what is this ugly stuff? It's simply that the app exists in 100 languages. So I can't just type, you know, an English text. It has to be some, it has to be uh, that thing here, index.button.the dot 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 name of the function. And this piece of text is going to be replaced by the equivalent in the language of the user. So I'm going to call it uh, ta -da, name of the map of science or maps, plural, maps of science. And what does it do when you click on it? Well, it should it should uh, you know, uh, navigate to uh, uh, the page. So this page is going to be called Maps of. So as you see, I, I don't have a lot of imagination here. It's the same every, OK. And this button appears at the top of the page. And I think, I'm sure actually, I have I've copied the button at the buttons at the bottom at the bottom of the page just as a reminder for this for the visitors. Yes, exactly there. So I'm just gonna pay gonna paste it there. Okay. Just same button but at the bottom of the page, just as a reminder for the users. And then yeah, then as I said, I should just add a page where So I'm going to create a new folder. Maps of science. Okay, it's there. 
and in it I should create a, an HTML file called Maps of Science. Uh, so I'm going to create a very simple one, right? Because it's it's just oh, I'm going to create something that says in progress, but. Uh, which one should I choose? Which one is the simplest? Yeah, I'm going to copy this one here. I'm going to paste it here. How can I paste? Okay, I rename it. Maps of science. And when I click on it, Inside, I have the original page, which is which has nothing to do, you know, it's with the other. Uh, so I should remove everything, right? Because yeah, I should remove everything. Uh, this thing looks. Yeah, I'm gonna just add something that says in progress. Come back often. In progress, and then the rest I just delete, I suppose. Good. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, then, 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 yeah. So it's, this is really, you know, window dressing at the moment. And then what I should start doing is a function, you know, to, to do stuff. Uh, so it's going to, again, it's going to be several weeks and months, but let's start. It's pretty fun. So these are, in this subfolder, this, this is the, the heart of the app. As you see, I have a file pair function. Uh, yeah. I'm going to use... Uh, any, anything goes. This one needs to convert uh, GIFI files to VOS viewer files. Anyone uh, fits. Let's take Kowo. Kowo is the one I. Kowo is to turn a text into networks of words. So I'm going to just copy it and I paste it in the same. I copy it in the same folder, but I'm going to call it map. Maps of science bin. A bin is just a, it's, it's just a, a file, basically. Maps of, in Java, maps of science. Maps of science bin. Okay. Maps of science bin. So that's this one. And I should just rename Okay, I should delete everything I don't need in it, like like literally everything. I should so the code word is gonna be I think I have to reuse the name of the it's gonna be maps of science. And then I delete I did it everything. It's an empty, it's a blank state basically. Wow, that's a long function. Wow, this one is super long. Uh, boop, boop, boop. Okay, as you see, that's, so that's really the, 
that's the, the backbone of a function. It's, it's super empty. All right, and I can remove all these import statements. Yeah, that's, do you see it here? That's it. So if we are back in our map of science, file, it's all good. And in our index file, what did we do? Oh, we had this, we have to create this. You know, I say that this is actually, uh, this index.button.mapsofscience is going to be replaced by uh, the equivalent in French or Spanish or English. So how does it do? Well, I have actually a piece of code. So let me show you where it happens. This is there, so let me show you. Where is the app? I so many projects. Okay, so that's this is the app. These are the paid web pages. This is where you have the Java files. And if you look at other sources, no. Oh no, it's there. Sorry, it's in the Java files. It shouldn't be there actually, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, in this folder, I have all the I have all the texts in all the different languages. So I'm going to take the one in English here. Come on, yeah. And if I open it, if I open it, you're going to see it's like pretty wild. It opens actually all the the files for all the languages. So each line is a piece of text and each column is the same text but in different languages. So I don't speak 107 languages. Far from it. So I'm going to use a translator to so what I do first is that I type, you know, this kind of agnostic language, agnostic thing. It's called index.button.mapsofscience. I click on OK. And when I have clicked on OK, if we wait a bit, it should be, yeah, it has been created there at the, at the bottom and it's empty for all languages. So I'm going to scroll for the English version. And, I, and uh, it's a bit hard to find. Yeah, found it. And I type maps of science in English, which is maps of science. maps of science. And that's it. I leave the other languages empty. Now I shift to a program I have created. It's not a program. It's like a, a bit of a couple of lines of, I call it translation. And basically what this program does is it connects to Google Translate. Oops, that's a bit okay. strange. Okay, that's better. Yeah. Uh, it connects to Google and it translates the text in English in in all the other languages. And I just have to click on Run, I think, and it does it. If you look at the output, it's going to fill in.
Okay, so it's not informative at all, but uh, trust me, each line means that it has been translated in a new language. So wait uh, 10 seconds and it's going to translate in 100 languages. Almost finished. very soon bit longer than uh, what I expected. Is there something I forgot? Uh, Super strange. It's like blocked. Okay, finished. Uh, it's not supposed to be so long. That my anyway, so that's it. And I just finished with not Google, but I shift to Deeple for just one language. Brazilian Portuguese, which uh, is not available in Google. So that's just one language, it should be fast. Okay, done. It was for Brazilian Portuguese and Portuguese from Portugal. So done. And now we have translated the button. Maps of science, you should, uh, let's have a look. So I'm gonna launch the, the app, uh, not on the web, but just on my computer. And while it launches, I would like to go back to, oops, not history of Giphy. <laughs> uh, I would like to go back to the plan for, for this app, right? So try and develop maps of science. How are, are we going to do it? And I started really by the very, uh, you know, kind of uh, kind of gimmicky thing, which is to create a button for it, <laughs> and there is nothing behind. Uh, but at least symbolically, we get started. But now, if we want to do it in earnest, what do we want to do? And I was thinking of that last week. I think it's pretty encouraging. First, retrieve the list of all existing journals from OpenLX. Then, for each journal in for each journal, so as you see, uh, it's a kind of loop of a loop. For each journal, retrieve the articles published in it in the last three years. Then, 
for each article retrieve the names of the authors and of course take only the authors with an ORCID ID because otherwise we will not be able to disambiguate them. I will not say ORCID ID because I suppose the last two letters of ORCID already stand for ID. Um, I didn't check but I suppose that's the case. And then so that's <coughs> that's the computationally I mean that's the data intensive part but it seems to me it's you know we have about I didn't check but I would say we have less than 20,000 journals So how many articles per journal, it's something that can really be, uh, that can vary, but, uh, and I'm not sure an average makes sense because we're gonna have huge outliers, but, but let's do an average. Nonetheless, uh, I would say that a journal, if, it ha if it's a monthly journal, which is uh, rarely the case, a monthly journal, uh, uh, it, it has, It has uh, 30 articles per issue. So 30 times 12 times 3. So it's about 1,000. Oops. Oh, the, the app is launching. So again, it's... It's super slow, but it's because I'm streaming. Usually things are so much quicker. So that's how the app looks like now, now that we have changed it. So as you see, I have some, oops. I have some CS issues with the CSS uh, when I deploy uh, my app uh, locally on my own computer. Uh, but there is nothing much I can do. But as you see, we have a new button there, which says Carte de la Science in French, and which we could translate in, let's take Spanish, Dutch already first. Carten, oh, it has shifted to a, a proper view. Carten der Wissenschaft. And Spanish, what do we have? Spanish, Spanish, Portuguese, Espanol. Mapas de la Ciencia. And if we click on it, yeah, we have just in progress come back often. Which is nice because that's exactly where we are. Okay, so that was just uh, for the sake of kicking, kicking off the project. Um, so what I was saying, we were there, right? It's about 100, 1,000 items. I'm not saying articles because actually we might have different things. So each journal has about 1,000 items published over the last three years, again, with huge variations. And for each item, retrieve the names of the authors, and that varies a lot per discipline. Uh, but on average, if we say an average of, of 10, I suppose, is super, super conservative. Yeah. So in total, we're going to have, oh, OK. So we're going to have, OK, so that's we're going to have all of that. So what do we do with that? 
for each journal uh, of it or rather for each journal. Basically what we're going to do is a pairwise comparison between journals. Uh, so for each journal x, you take another loop. For each journal x or y, so for each journal x, uh, take the vector or list, I will see, or set of their authors. Do the same for the journal Y, and then the magic operation is do a similarity comparison the vectors of X and Y. And what we have here is a network. If X, if the journal X and Y have some authors in common, they're going to have a connection between them. Uh, the connection is going to be super weak if just one author has published in the two journals over the last three years. Uh, but the connection is going to be stronger if, if several authors have published in the same journals. So while I'm saying that, I realize that uh, it's not super... I mean, you see so many ways this is imperfect. What we could do instead, uh, that's really funny, is the opposite. That's actually super interesting, and that's exactly the, the same logic. So, or we could do something else, and maybe you see me coming here. For each orchid, but that's no, oh, that one. That one is too big. Ah, uh, let's see. Who cares? We have about. I don't know how many authors we have on Orchid now. Let's have a look. There is a place where they state how many... How many uh, researchers they, they have. Oh, there. 16 million. It's not that big. More statistics. Sixteen million. Sixteen million, that's pretty.
Okay, never mind. That seems a bit complicated to create a social network of scientists at the scale of a 60 million population. But why not? 60 million is not that big. But what would what would we do with it? I'm not exactly sure. So I would I would leave it for for another time. I'm gonna delete it here. Okay, so the plan is exactly this one. It's you know, uh, it's, I could state it in nine lines. It's not super complicated and I have the tooling to do it. So we have five minutes left and what I would like to do is start that. So I'm gonna create a, a new function and I'm gonna push it to GitHub so that we can find it uh, next week uh, to, to start where we left today. So we're going to create a Java application. So the way it works, just for the context, I have this web application where we have added the button. But of course, all the heavy lifting, you know, all the, the, the code for the functions, they are in separate projects. Otherwise, I, my no-code functions web application would be one huge bulky um, project and that would be super slow to evolve. So what I have done instead is that I have separated the, the web, uh, the front end, the web front of the application, which is standing alone. And then I have these standalone functions that, you know, like this one I'm creating now. So uh, no, no surprise is gonna be called Maps of Science. <laughs> Uh, and these standalone functions are there and the, the web application is just calling them uh, when a user makes use of the, you know, when somebody makes use of the, uh, of the function. So it's pretty simple. Uh, I'm just finding the place where I should create this new function. Exactly there. Okay, fine. Yeah, I suppose I'm going to create many different small Java projects because there is the app, but there is also the, I mean, there is many sub components and maybe I don't want to stick all of them together. That's for later. Okay. Okay, I have this map here of science project. I think I'm gonna need two projects. One which is the, wow, well, I'm gonna need many projects. Maybe the first one would be the, the retrieval of, of OpenAlex data. Uh, so it should be called OpenAlex, you know, data, uh, data retriever, but uh, uh, never mind, I'm gonna do it later. I'm gonna rename it later. So we, we're there, so I'm gonna simply create a GitHub project for it. Google Maps of Science.
the function to create or use maps of science. So now I can go to the place where I have created. Let me show you where that is. So these are the functions that I use for the, I'm initiating a git repo here. Uh, I'm adding everything to it. I'm going to add the readme and the git in your uh, ignore later. Stop doing that and just follow the instructions. Yeah, and then that's the upstream uh, whatever option. I, I can't remember. I just want to copy paste it. Yeah, this one. Okay, pushing. Yeah, pushed. And so if we back on our GitHub repo right there, if I just refresh the page. Okay, we got our initial code. So that's it for today. What we, we have not done much, but uh, but we, we have a button, a blue button. And, uh, and we, if we are back here, we also have a, we are ready to, what I'm going to do next week is super simple. Again, it's a bit, I'm a bit, uh, you know, uh, I don't wait. <laughs> but what I want to do next week is really have the fun to do my first calls to the OpenAlex API. I would like to see in practice, can I retrieve the list of uh, 16,000 journals in, in, in a few minutes, or is it, is it too big? And then how, how feasible it is to retrieve their list of articles, and then their lists of authors. Uh, we'll see you know, how feasible that, that is. If that is feasible, then it's the highway to the maps of science. Thank you, Veronica. I'm super glad you told me my, I had left my mic uh, switched off. <laughs> Thank you for, for being here. And uh, yeah, see you next week for, for some coding and API calls. Cheers. <laughs>